Okay, I think we're recording now. Ryan, I'm okay. going to shut off my mic until you need me. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. In my case, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is the fourth of our uh, of our series of uh, lectures about study design analysis and programming. And what you should be seeing now is a copy of the first four lectures. The only reason I mentioned something like this is that today we'll be talking about some issues confounding and bias and tech modification that, that um, pertain to all the study designs. But this lecture wraps up the first four, oh, Audrey, uh, wraps up the first four uh, lectures that dealt with basic epidemiology and study design. Just looking ahead, uh, I'll make this announcement at the end of the day also that tomorrow, remember, is a break. It's an off week, it's a uh, holiday up here in the, in the Northeast. Uh, but more importantly, I'm going to be traveling next week, so I won't be around on Monday. So we won't be meeting again until two weeks. And at that time, we're going to shift gears, and we're going to talk about analysis. And that'll go on for five weeks. So next week, we begin some overview lectures on basic biostatistics. But today, I want to finish talking about epidemiology, in particular, talk about the topics of Founding and bias and effect modification. So let me move into that. This is a quote that I picked up from a one of the classic epidemiology books by Charles Hennikins and Julie Burring called Epidemiology in Medicine. It used to be the book we used at Harvard 10, 15, uh, 20 years ago. It was written in the early 1980s. Uh, it became dated, and that's why it's not used that much. But this is a quote that uh, is from their text, and it says, um, they're talking about the situation when you do a study and you, you observe a relationship between some, between some risk factor and some outcome. So let's suppose you're doing a study like we asked you to think about last weekend, uh, where you were designing a study to compare Native Hawaiian or Pacific uh, people who were somehow exposed to a telemedicine uh, method of providing uh, care versus those who were not exposed to telemedicine in terms of some outcomes, like the quality of care they were receiving for their diabetes. And suppose you do a study and you measure some outcome, like body mass index or hemoglobin A1c, uh, among those who were exposed or uh, access to telemedicine. Uh, communication versus those who were not given access, and you find there's, there's an outcome difference in the two groups. And now before you conclude that that difference might be attributed to the fact that one group received telemedicine and the other didn't, Hennigans and Burring says that we have epidemiologists have to rule out alternative reasons that we see such an association. And this quote says it is necessary to assess the validity of any observed statistical association by excluding possible alternative explanations. In other words, what are the reasons we might see better care among those people given access to telemedicine compared to those who didn't? One is the role of chance. And we'll be talking about statistics in two weeks when we start that section of the book. But another real possibility is you can have a biased study design. You could have enrolled the wrong people, or you could have recorded the wrong information. As a result, the number you see in your study really does not reflect the effect of being exposed to telemedicine. There's a mistake in your study. That's what we mean by bias. And there's also the possibility that what you might be seeing are the effects of other variables that are responsible for this association. And those are what we call confounding factors or confounders. That brings up the topic of confounding. So the first two things I want to talk about today are things that can go wrong in your study design, namely biases in the design of the study, or the role of these other factors, these confounding factors, somehow confusing your results. And we'll talk about both of those in a little bit of detail today. But first, let's talk about bias. And first, let's get an idea of what bias means. And first of all, bias is a mistake. It's an error in the design of your study. And basically, it means that you are prone from the very beginning to get a wrong result, an invalid result from your study, because you have made a mistake in the design of your study. And there are many, many, many different types of biases. But basically, they can be grouped into two types. 
There are biases due to the people you enroll in your study. Those are called selection biases. And they recur to enrolling the wrong people or somehow losing them to follow up during the study if you're doing a cohort study or if you're doing an experimental study. And another class of biases are called observational biases or information biases or measurement biases. They occur, they happen when you collect data on these individuals and start assigning numbers to people. Numbers that might reflect their body mass index or numbers that might reflect the hemoglobin A1C or numbers that might be labels telling them whether these uh, people are Native Hawaiians or not Native Hawaiians. And if you assign the wrong numbers to people, that could be the cause when you're getting an incorrect result in your study. So realize that there are two main types of biases, selection biases and observational biases. And I'll try to give you some examples of each of those as we go through the first part of, of this morning's um, uh, talk. Now, if you have a bias in a study, which you probably unfortunately will, there's no perfectly clean study. The first challenge for you to do as an investigator is to evaluate whether there is a bias or not. And that basically means the first thing you have to do is try to identify the source of the bias. Is the bias due to a selection problem or is the bias due to a measurement problem? The next thing you should do is try to get an idea of whether this is a serious problem or not. Is the association you're observing in your study way, way, way out of kilter? Or is it slightly just a little bit off center? In other words, is the answer you're getting from your study something that is close to reflecting the true effect of, of the exposure, say, telemedicine on some outcome? Or are you getting a totally in, incomprehensive, totally confusing, totally wrong answer? And that involves not only identifying whether it's a, it's a strong bias or a weak bias, but also getting some idea of the implications of which way this biasing might lead you in terms of getting a wrong result. Is your observed association too big? Is it an overestimate of truth? Or is it too small? Is it an underestimate of truth? That might help you decide how you can interpret, if at all, the results in your study. But the problem is, is typically very little you can do in the analysis to correct for biases. Unlike confounding factors, the next topic we'll be talking about in about 20 minutes or so. There's really nothing you can do analytically in most situations to adjust or correct for biases in a study design. You have to live with what you've done. And therefore, it's very important to anticipate these biases when you are designing a study so as to not run into the problem that your results might be totally invalid. Well, let's talk a little bit about the two types of biases in more detail. Uh, there's an epidemiologist by the name of John Last, who's a Canadian epidemiologist, and he's written a book on called The Dictionary of Epidemiology that I, that I have from his book uh, in regards to a selection bias. He refers to an error, in other words, a mistake, due to the systematic differences and characteristics between those who are selected for the study and those who are not. Basically, what a selection bias means, you've enrolled the wrong people not the people you think you should have in the study, but in some sense it's the wrong people. And that usually refers to the comparison group. Remember the first lecture we gave, or I gave, I was talking about the ideal study. The ideal, to, and I think we were back then talking about spam consumption and the effect of eating a diet that's enriched with spam and what sort of outcomes that might cause. I said the perfect design of a study would be to enroll a bunch of people who eat spam routinely, follow them over time, measure their outcome, and then put them in a time machine, go back to when you first enrolled them in the study, but somehow change their life so they never ate spam. And now do the same thing over again. Follow them forwards in time, measure the same outcome. And I said that's the perfect study because you'd be comparing everybody to themselves everybody to themselves under two, two dis, uh, different situations. One when they were eating spam and one when they were not eating spam. But everything else would remain the same. Their sex wouldn't change, their age wouldn't change. Anything else that influences the outcome would remain the same, except that in one situation they were consuming spam, another situation they weren't. And we said at this time, although this is a beautiful study to conceive of, not a practical study, but you can't put people in the time machine.